future Grand Duchess and new martyr Elizabeth was born in 1864, the second of seven children. She was the daughter of the Grand Duke of Hessen-Darmstadt and Princess Alice, daughter of Queen Victoria. She was also the elder sister of Alex, who was to become Alexandra Fyodorovna, Empress of Russia and wife of Nicholas II. Ella, as she was known, was the second of the four beautiful Hesse sisters. She had been brought up by her mother, Princess Alice, to serve others and had accompanied her mother on numerous visits to hospitals, orphanages and veterans' homes and had not been shielded from death or tragedy. From her early youth she had suffered the death of her younger siblings, Frederick and Mary, and then that of her mother. Thinking not of herself, she tried to console those around her, including her grandmother, Queen Victoria, and made every effort to live up to the pious and selfless example of her namesake, St Elizabeth of Turingen and Hungary, after whom she had been named. Ella first met her husband Serge in her early youth and became fond of him during his lengthy visits to Jugendheim with his mother. Serge, the Grand Duke Sergei, was the fifth son of Alexander II and uncle of the future Nicholas II. He was highly cultured with artistic tendencies, reserved and deeply religious, always looking to help those in need. The latter traits would most certainly have appealed to Ella, who was herself deeply religious and driven by concern for the welfare of others. Ella was 19 when she and Serge married and she went to Russia. Eventually, after much study, thought and prayer, she decided to become an Orthodox Christian and she was received into the Orthodox Church in 1891. This conversion formally marked what had been a journey of faith as the Grand Duchess embraced Russia, her culture and her peoples, and loved them as she loved her husband. In 1891, her deeply religious husband was appointed Governor of Moscow by Emperor Alexander III. However, tragedy occurred, and on the 4th of February 1905, while she was leaving her home to do charitable work, Elizabeth heard a terrible explosion. Hurrying towards where the explosion had come from, she saw a soldier stretching his greatcoat over some of the remains of her husband. He had just been killed by a terrorist bomb, and his body had been blown apart by the blast. Profoundly shocked, Elizabeth drew strength from her faith and still found the courage to visit Ivan Kalyaev, her husband's murderer. She hoped to get him to repent before he was executed and brought him a book of Gospels and a small icon, which she left in his cell. The shock of her husband's murder prompted a great change in Elizabeth. She withdrew from social life and adopted a vegetarian diet, being unable to eat flesh after what had happened to Serge. She resolved to devote her life to the Orthodox Church and bought a house and a large piece of land in Moscow. The community she established was, from 1909, known as the Convent of Mercy of St. Martha and St. Mary. The founding tenets of the convent were very particular to Elizabeth's vision for her religious institution and informed the way it operated. Considering work to be the basis of all religious life and prayer to be its reward, the Grand Duchess wanted her nuns and the work of her convent to alleviate the suffering of the sick, poor and ill-educated. Consequently, on taking the veil, her sisters would not renounce completely all earthly life and contact with secular society. Hence the operation of the hospital and dental clinic incorporated into the convent was fully supported by the sisters and the mother superior herself. The day began at 6am at the convent and the routine followed monastic practice. After common morning prayers in the hospital church, the Grand Duchess gave the sisters instructions for the working day. At midday, during the meal, one of the sisters read from the lives of saints. At 5pm, it was Vespers followed by Matins, and at 9pm evening prayers were read in the hospital church, following which the sisters received a blessing from their mother superior and retired to their cells for the night. As Mother Superior, Elizabeth led an ascetic life. She fasted rigorously and existed only on a diet of milk, eggs and vegetables and bread. She arose at midnight to pray in her chapel or to visit the hospital ward, frequently staying at the bedside of a patient in pain or fear, doing everything she could to soothe their anguish. 
Occupying only three rooms in the convent, a study, sitting room and bedroom, Elizabeth denied herself all that had been plentiful in her previous life as a Grand Duchess. Her quarters were painted white and adorned only with icons, while her furniture was sparse and simple. Elizabeth achieved a superhuman amount of work, seamlessly threading it into her day. She undertook the hardest tasks herself, never asking her sisters for help or expecting them to shoulder her workload in any way. Every day she had to examine countless petitions and letters from all corners of the country, and she received many visitors from all backgrounds, to each of whom she gave her time and assiduous attention. In the hospital she assumed the most taxing and skilled roles, assisting at operations and surgical dressings, as well as nursing, but also devoting precious hours to sitting at the bedside of those in need of spiritual succour. Elizabeth's correspondence with Tsar Nicholas is very revealing. There survived some 100 letters and cards written by her to her brother-in-law. They had been exchanging letters for a long time, ever since their lives intertwined through marriage, and what is remarkable is her confessional tone. She opens her heart to Nicholas and discusses God with him, and, although it is not surprising, I still cannot fail to be struck by how modest and humble she is. In one letter from April 1909, she writes Nicholas, I can be disappointed in myself, but then I also have no illusion, and don't imagine I am different to others. I want to work for God and in God for suffering mankind. Her tone is often self-admonitory, as she admits what she sees as her flaws and failings, but in this she also reveals the essence of herself, showing that she is someone who is ever striving to better herself before God. What also becomes clear from Elizabeth's letters to Nicholas is how much she values him as a correspondent. She wants to reveal her motivations to him, but also I think she finds she can explore herself through opening up to him, so that her letters become both explanatory and exploratory in tone. For example, in another letter from April 1909, she writes, I took up the life I am now leading, not as a cross, but as a road full of light God showed me after Serge's death, and which years and years before had begun in my soul. I can't tell you when. It seems to me often that already as a child there was a longing to help those that suffer. She also looks to Nicholas for approval, and this is evident in a letter she wrote him in 1910, before she was made abbess of her convent. She says, Pray for me, dearie. I am going deeper into our Orthodox Church and becoming a missionary of Christian faith and charity work. And, oh dear, I am so unworthy of it all and I do so want blessings and prayers. And then, just a few days later, she writes, Dearest brother dear, I ask your blessing, prayers and forgiveness before the solemn day I am approaching. Please, please be convinced that however awkward or sinful my poor earthly life may go, I am a true subject of yours. The will is always full of good intentions and religious wishes, even if on the way I stumble and make endless mistakes. <laughs> 